Hello everyone, this is Professor Todd Giles and we are coming to the end of the Roman art period and then we'll go directly into early Christian and then into Byzantine. And here at the beginning we're going to look at the burial arts of the Romans. Originally the Romans would cremate their dead, uh, burn them until it was just ashes, uh, and then hold the ashes in some sort of container. Uh, this happened with Julius Caesar and other leaders especially. Um, but as the Christian church increased in Rome, even though it was still illegal, it did influence uh, segments of society, and the Romans started burying their dead above ground in sarcophagi, or coffins. This is a sarcophagus featuring a battle scene between the Romans and barbarians. Now, in this scene, we see lots and lots of people, and in the middle, we see this guy, and if you look at his face, it's a little bit different than the others. It's not as well created, there's no emotion on it, and from other evidence, we can see that this is probably the deceased. This is a portrait of whoever it is that is contained within this box. What would happen is the design here would be mass produced, many, 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 many by highly trained artisans, and then they would leave this part uncut, just a raw piece of stone sticking out, and then the family members would come in and select the box, and then they would sculpt a portrait of the person in that spot. It's in the very middle, it's on the top, thus we can understand that that is that person. There are actually many, many, many other examples of this. Here's another one where the full box is created, and then the center area would have been left raw and then sculpted to contain the actual body of the, the family member who has passed on. Now, as we go into the Christian era, we need to talk about the catacombs. But before we talk about the catacombs, let's talk about general hallmarks of the early Christian uh, art era. Um, really three things to see here. Um, the hidden symbols, because Christianity was still illegal within the empire, um, the Christians would actually use hidden symbols. Uh, shepherds, peacocks, doves with the olive branch in their beak, uh, the fish or ichthus. Um, so these symbols were actually taken from Roman culture and Romans would know what they were, except the Romans would take them, or the Christians would take them and change their meaning as a secret code. Uh, the famous uh, symbol of the fish, the ichthus, uh, writing it in the sand with a toe uh, to signify to someone that they were a Christian. And if someone saw that and they weren't a Christian, that they wouldn't understand what the symbol meant. Okay. Um, another one is the symbols of the culture, even the mythology. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit here and even more when we talk about the Byzantine. And then the architecture later on after Christianity is legalized, they take on Roman architecture, especially the basilica, uh, that long straight building with a central nave area uh, being very tall compared to the sides and aisles on either side, um, called a basilica. And even today, the basilica style is somewhat popular in church design. So now let's talk about the catacombs. Um, because this is a Christian school, I'm not going to go in depth into the catacombs and, and what they were fully about. Um, I'll leave that to your Bible history classes or New Testament classes. Um, but just take a look at this and what we see as shelves on either side of this hallway are not just shelves, but these are areas where bodies would be laid to rest. 
Okay, so on either side, and you can see there's one, two, three, four, maybe even five layers of people right there in that small area. So you had a lot of bodies and a very small amount of space. So in front of each one of these, you can imagine something like this, which is a marble palette, a marble plate. Um, the full length would be placed there and then would be plastered on the edges to seal um, the space. Now, one thing about the Christians was they respected the body of the dead because they knew that in the resurrection, that body would be resurrected. Okay, so there's a great love for the body itself and there's a great love for their loved one. And usually there were inscriptions talking about uh, maybe the person's name, many times how old they were, and then some sort of blessing. Um, and this person was nine years, nine months, and three days old, so a nine-year-old. Uh, not quite 10 years old. We don't know whether it was a martyr or whether it was um, just natural death. Uh, childhood death was quite prevalent in Rome, and so we don't know on this one, but we do have that. And there's a few more that, or many more that have been found. Here's a couple that I especially like. The one on top, um, the person is, and I don't know whether that's an I-I or a V. Um, looks like an N, but it shouldn't be in Roman numerals. Uh, but it's about 21 or 24 years old, so a young person. And here's, to me, one of the earliest images of Christ, of uh, especially in the catacombs, Christ in a toga, no beard, with a halo, and then he has his hand up and some sort of maybe whip or um, stick or something over a tomb, and here is Lazarus wrapped up, coming forth, and you sort of see a face there. So he's standing up, coming, coming out of the tombs. Um, and then here's another one where we have portraits of both Peter, Petrus, and Paul, Paulus, here and then the sign of Christ. And then in other areas, there were larger rooms that were actually created to be like a chapel. And here's one that has a fresco painted on the ceiling. So this is plaster built up and then painted with vegetable paint or mineral paint um, so that the color becomes part of the actual plaster. And we have here the Good Shepherd. So the Good Shepherd, the young man in a tunic with a lamb over his shoulder, that is a Roman image. It comes from Roman mythology and it becomes the image of Christ, the Good Shepherd. And then around the outside here, images of the story of Jonah. And then these are probably apostles or possibly prophets. And you can see some of the bones here. These are probably middle, uh, medieval or Renaissance believers who actually wanted to be buried down in the catacombs. Uh, these are probably not the original bones. Here's some close-ups of the story of Jonah him being spit out of the whale, the, the sea creature. And here he is being thrown overboard. And then here's the, the sea creature waiting to eat him up. And then in 313 AD, something marvelous happened. After years of civil war between Constantine and another um, co-emperor, uh, Constantine was victorious. And part of his victory was he supposedly became a Christian. Um, we'll leave that to um, other classes to debate, um, but he did create the Edict of Milan, which gave religious freedom to Christianity and actually all religions um, to be practiced. So Christianity was able to come out from the shadows, and supposedly he did become a Christian and was baptized on his deathbed later. Now, one of the things 
um, that came about because of that was now Christians could do things in public like bury their dead. And here we have a sarcophagus by Juni or of Junius Bassus. So we have a coffin of a believer from around 359 AD that's very well made, very detailed. But if you look at this and compare it with the sarcophagus that we saw earlier that was so detailed, this is showing a little bit of the detail work and the fine uh, craftsmanship going down. This is still very good, but we start to see these bodies with heads that are too big, bodies that are too small, and just less detail. Less finesse is going into the creation of the artwork. Now, another thing that came about due to Constantine legalizing Christianity was the creation of St. Peter's Basilica. This is old St. Peter's. Um, this is on the same site as the present day St. Peter's in Rome. Uh, but the very first one was in this design. This is a basilica, and we'll see more basilicas as we go through. So we're just going to take a little bit of time here um, to talk about it, to understand the different pieces um, and the language of a basilica. Um, here's a woodcut from the Middle Ages showing what it looked like. Um, since it's non-existent, this is very important to see. You have the central nave, which is this tall area, and then you have an aisle here and an aisle here. Um, so it's a little bit different than a modern uh, churches where we have pews and then we have the aisles in between the pews. This is actually like a colonnade or a walkway. Um, and notice it's underneath a side roof where the nave is taller. Um, here is a um, diorama of what it would have looked like. And why was it selected here? Um, this is on the other side of the Tiber River um, in a section of Rome that was actually sort of an outcast area. Um, it was near the, um, the Circus of Nero. Um, now that doesn't mean like our circus with elephants and horses and tigers and bears, um, but it's a horse racing track for chariot racing. Um, and it was up on the Vatican here, hill where the Vatican is placed today um, near Rome or outside on the other side of the river from Rome. And it's famous um, because that is where the Apostle Peter was martyred and then buried. And when Constantine ordered this church, the first official church in Christendom, uh, to be created, he selected the site. And here on the image, you can see an altar and this apse in the background. And underneath this altar, supposedly, is supposed to be the burial place of St. Peter. And once we get to the Baroque era, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but let's talk in general terms of the different parts of a basilica. Um, on this floor plan, we've already talked a little bit about number one is the nave, which is that central area. The term nave actually comes from the Latin term for ship because in their minds, this looked like a ship turned upside down where you have the hole on the bottom. And now it's been turned up so that the hole is facing upwards. So this is like a ship design. And then on number two, we've got these aisles on either side. And then three is an apse, which is sort of like a bump out, half circle, extending out from a wall. And that's usually the primary place. And that's very much a Roman design taken from the Roman Empire imperial buildings. And then number four is a transept, which is perpendicular to the nave. And we see all four of these building blocks as we go on with the rest. And next is the Byzantine area. Uh, 